Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to be uh, moving. Hang on, that's not working. Let's try the other one. I'm going to be moving from strategic down to tactical and back up again. But let me just remind you what the naval side of this war is about. It's about supply. It is a war for the <coughs> control of the global economy, not simply the cross-channel supply of the forces in Europe. This is about control of the global economy. And in 1916, before the Battle of Jutland, where it's something of an imperfect state, the British have been able to close off the German the economy in large part to the Germans, but because there are neutral nations such as the Netherlands and Scandinavia, and because the Americans are busy making as much money as they can, are not able to close off the global economy completely. The Germans have no means of getting at the British except through, they decide, the submarine, the U-boat. Uh, and they are doing that. Uh, they have tried to do so in a very unrestricted total war way, but again have been protected by, have been prevented from continuing with that by the Americans, because, as one American said, the British are thieves, but the Germans are murderers. The Lusitania and other ships being sunk had forced the Germans to walk back. The North Sea is the main theatre for the action between the main forces that are both allowing the British to control the global economy in the form of the Grand Fleet, which is based up at uh, a number of bases in Scotland, Rosyth near Edinburgh, Cromarty Firth, and the main fleet up in Scalpa Flow. In the uh, anchorages uh, of uh, the Yarda, the Visa and the Elbe, is the high sea fleet, which is really protecting, at this stage, the German Germany from the British being able to mount any direct attacks and really being providing a secure base for the U-boats. But because they've walked back on the unrestricted campaign, the Germans have decided to renew an effort they'd had a crack at unsuccessfully at the start of the war to attrite the Grand Fleet. They have a smaller force, but they believed a combined armed approach will allow them to um, achieve enough losses in the Grand Fleet that then they can redress the balance. Let me just shift down to some of the naval problems we're thinking about in terms of what people are doing. Uh, this is a picture of the second division of the second battle squadron. These are what are called super dreadnoughts. This is Orion, Thunderer, Conqueror, and Monarch. They had great names for ships. Uh, this represents the median of naval technology at sea. This is a super dreadnought. It is coal powered with oil supplement. It can go about 20 knots. It carries 10 13.5 inch guns. Uh, they are given fed information through range finders ranging from nine to 15 feet base. There is a centralised fire control system with a director uh, which fires the main armament in a coordinated way, basically one gun from each turret at a time. It's five gun, it's five gun salvos. Uh, inside the ship is a basic electromagnetic uh, me mechanical computer. One of the first gyroscopes to go to sea is in these ships. Uh, they represent the culmination or really, a, it's not so much the culmination as a middle point of a revolution that's been in train for about 20 years. And just to give you six degrees of separation, uh, Professor Hugh White's grandfather was serving in the ship from which this photograph would have been taken. So it's a small world. This is the median uh, of the centre of the fleet at the time. However, let me just uh, make a few reminders from a naval point of view to land artillery people. Both the target and the firing unit are moving all the time. Therefore, your calculation problem is not simply worrying about change of rate, um, a change of range, but the rate at which the range is changing and then the rate at which the rate of change of <laughs> range is changing. It is a complex computational problem to work it out at long range. Second, there are no fixed references. Now, this also creates a wider problem than simply the gunnery problem of which you must be aware. The North Sea is a very difficult place to know where you are. There were no artificial aids at the start of the war. They were starting 
uh, to think about radio direction finding, and by later on in the war that was starting to come in quite effectively. But basically, for the war, no ship could be certain of where they were within five nautical miles after being about five hours out of sight of land. That means you're in a pool of uncertainty of about 75 square nautical miles or a couple of hundred square kilometres. Everybody is in that pool of uncertainty all the time. By the way, the ships had a reasonable idea of where they were. Aircraft hadn't the faintest idea where they were. And it's well worth while looking at the Zeppelin raids on England and where they thought they were and where they actually were bore no resemblance. Although aircraft were really good at telling you what the enemy's course was, interestingly enough. OK, so this revolution had started 20 years before. And really, that revolution had started when it became realised that there was a fundamental divergence between the ballistic capabilities of increasingly capable, well-manufactured and accurate guns and trying to actually aim them with a bloke standing beside the gun pointing it. And this is literally the start of the revolution in about 1896 on board HMS Scylla. And what happened over the next 20 years, to show you what HMS Orion was, is literally a movement from this, from conducting target practices at very slow speed at a few hundred yards range, a few hundred metres, to moving up to the ballistic range of the gun. Now, I will accept, with all the difficulties, when we talk about effective uh, gunfire in the Navy, we're only talking about a 2% two, two to 3% chance of hitting. So it is a complex problem and remains one. Oops, sorry. But there's something else that is driving this revolution, apart from the fact that the guns themselves are ballistically capable of reaching out many thousands of yards. It is that from about 1880 onwards, starting only with an effective range of a couple of hundred yards, locomotive torpedoes come into the inventory. <coughs> And they start to get more and more effective, and indeed their relative effectiveness accelerates, particularly with developments from around about the late 1890s, early 1900s, which include gyroscopes and include much improved propulsion. And what happens is that the torpedoes get faster and longer range, and as the gun range is increasing, the torpedo range is increasing as well. So really at the start of World War I, you have this problem that the torpedo range is probably about the same as the gun, gun range. We're thinking about 20,000 yards maximum at this stage in ideal conditions. Now, those torpedoes are fired by a torpedo craft which are on the surface. You can see them, and indeed quick firing guns become the remedy in, to some re respect for surface torpedo craft. But again, starting around 1900 and accelerating, we have the development of the submarine. And there is no counter to the submarine at this stage. But what I do want to show you and make it very clear to you is this is happening really fast. Now, Marx made the point, which I think is very fair, that people could lack vision. One point I've made, which I think is a difficulty when we're looking at these things in hindsight, and we're looking conceptually at these things, is that science fiction had been invented before all this happened. And one of the problems is that you get people who see a capability and perceive its full potential, but don't understand that actually it takes a whole lot of things to, to come together for it to reach its full potential. And the submarine is a really good example. This, in fact, is HMS AE. One, oh, sorry, A2, which is one of the first two Australian submarines. Absolutely top line technology in 1914. Couldn't get better. British, by the way, apart from their diesel engines, are much better at submarines than the Germans. Radio, diesel engines, gyroscope, retractable periscope. Retractable periscope is about 1900. Radio, the first radio was not fitted in a submarine until about 1912. Gyroscopes really start to come in from about 1908. The Germans are a bit further advanced on that, but the British pick it up very fast. D 
Diesel engines, again, the first diesel submarine in the Royal Navy is 1908. So you're literally getting all these things which make a submarine work come together just at the start of the war. Most people did not know what they were doing in naval warfare in 1914 for very good reasons. So there are lots of parallels with what's going on on the Western Front in terms of the learning curves. Okay, now, the battle, this makes the battle fleet, it has to be all arms. Before you have things like submarines and ocean-going torpedo craft, a battle fleet consists of battleships and scouting vessels. Once you start to get all these small craft being out in the open sea with asymmetric capabilities, to use a modern term, yes, the battle fleet is still the thing that's going to make the difference, but it needs to be accompanied for protection and for offence. So the modern fleet, what's called the Grand Fleet of Battle, is literally invented in about 1911. And they're having real trouble making it work. Because radio is still being perfected. The concepts of using radio the way you talk to people by radio is being perfected, because until this point, naval tactics were all visual. Um, how you keep that fleet at sea together how these small, do these small craft can keep up in bad weather? Do they have endurance? All these things. It's a highly complex problem and it's only just being brought together. And it's been very quickly realised that the battle fleet is too big. Uh, the Grand Fleet at Jutland had 24 battleships, plus um, the battle cruiser fleet as well. Now these ships operate uh, they're roughly 200 metres long, they're 300 metres apart. Okay? The battle line is about six nautical miles. The visibility in the North Sea average is between three to eight nautical miles. It's very frequently much less than that. There's a ship in that picture. About five days a month on average. That's the sort of visibility. The control of this fleet was incredibly difficult. And, and this shows a, this is actually an oil burning battleship firing a salvo, but what you actually had happen with all those coal burning battleships and all the cordite was that if you went into a main action and there wasn't a strong wind blowing, you literally had the development of an industrial smog. So your visibility actually will reduce, even if it's good to start with. That's what happened at Jutland. Now, I talked about the sophisticated computers. This is a generation ahead, but is basically the same thing, the same electromagnetic computer inside what is called the transmitting station. It takes about 20 people to run it. There are literally people with all those dials and things working all of them. Now, I'll tell you an interesting story to, to show you can't, you have to be very careful how you look at institutions. In 1900, only flagships in the Royal Navy had a Royal Marine Band. In 1914, every single capital ship and armoured cruiser has a band. Now, you would assume, buddy Royal Navy, pompous, ceremonial, ceremonially fixated, all this sort of thing. No. Musicians were inherently literate, inherently pretty intelligent, and inherently manually adept. They're the guys who man the transmitting station. You have to look at things a little differently. OK, so we get the fleet. We get all these things. We have an electromagnetic computer. Some of them are helm-free. In other words, in theory, can work when you're manoeuvring. And yes, you can get some sort of solution at long range. But in fact, what becomes clear is that what really matters, even if you've got this solution and you're updating it with new ranges and all, these, all the information you can bring in, all your ballistics, all these things, is spotting really matters. Working out where the previous salvo fell and updating your solution in relation to that salvo. Now this shows a battleship in 1939, but that spotting top is really the idea of what's going on in 1914 to 1918, 
that people realise matters. There's somebody up there who can direct the armament in a controlled way, but who is actually going left 200, down 200. Now, how do you beat this? Well, one of the problems is that you have a moving target which, which strongly objects to having shells fall around it. It's a good technique. If a group of shells has fallen near you, you steer for it because the opposition will have corrected and you've just gone and negated the, the correction. Because this is what you're getting. These, this is HMS Orion mentioned earlier, which uh, has fired at practice in Scarpa Flow uh, five of her 13.5 inch guns, in other words, one gun from each turret, who have fallen that way. Four shots have fallen there, and one has fallen there. I'm not quite sure. The range is too high for ricochet. I actually think there might be a second shot, and there's only three. But this is what the captain of the Orion has in his diary. Um, and actually, what you wanted to have was about the right spread so that, in fact, you maximised your chance of getting at least one shell to hit. And there are big arguments as to what the size of that spread should be in ideal circumstances. OK, let's talk about Jutland. How did it happen? What happened? Jutland happens on the 31st of May and the 1st of June 1916. The German Admiral, Admiral Scheer, decides to have a combined arms attempt to attract the Grand Fleet. And what he does is he positions submarines outside all the British bases. The British, who have broken the German radio codes, and the Germans tend to use radio for administrative purposes, the British did not get a signal saying the Grand Fleet was sailing. What they would get would be a signal telling the boom defence vessel to open the gate for 12 hours, which means the high seas fleet will be sailing. So they actually sail the British fleet in response to the German fleet before the German fleet sails. And you have two main forces on either side. The advanced forces of battle cruisers, the British ones under Beatty, the German ones under Hipper, and the main fleets, the Grand Fleet under Jellicoe, and the High Sea Fleet under Scheer. The action takes place in three basic boxes. The initial encounter is the battle cruiser action here, which runs south until the British battle cruisers realise the High Sea Fleet is coming north and turn north to find the Grand Fleet. We next have the fleet action in early evening and then a night action when the German fleet was basically able to escape. As you can see, it takes up a great deal of the North Sea. There were 250 ships involved, 99 on the German and 151 on the British side. And how does it fall out? This is basically what's called the run to the south, which is the uh, action between the battle cruisers which is the action between the battle cruisers after they'd sighted each other, and they only sighted each other because German torpedo boats had stopped a Danish merchant ship to examine it, and the British cruisers saw the puff of smoke on the horizon and went to have a look. So, the run to the south is a, is a duel between the British battle cruisers and the German battle cruisers on either side. It's famous for the fact that two British battle cruisers blew up under German gunfire. British gunfire, a British gunnery, although the conditions weren't that brilliant for them, was not as good. And German ships were fairly robust. What happens when the British uh, beat, he sighted the German fleet, he turns north, hoping to find the Grand Fleet. Now, one of the great controversies is the lightly armed battle cruisers of the British, which uh, blew up. This shows just after HMS Queen Mary, which is on the right, she's that large uh, smoke cloud, uh, and that's HMS Lion, the British flagship, on the left. So that's the Queen Mary there. Yes, the British battlecruiser armour was too thin, there's no question, but the ships were sunk because of very poor anti-flash discipline. In other words, they didn't have all the interlocks and doors shut between magazines, handling rooms, and turret. And they also had enormous amounts of propellant 
at various stages in the chain because they were fixated on achieving a very high rate of fire. Had they kept to the precautions that were actually laid down at the time, and in, indeed the interesting thing is the lion, because her warrant officer gunner had a view on this, actually did have all the precautions. She did get a turret penetrated and she didn't blow up. The Queen Mary and indefatigable and late in the battle the Invincible did blow up. This is a picture of a turret. Um, it's a German one and in fact the key difference there is the Germans used brass um, cases for their cordite. The British actually had silk bags. Uh, so obviously the brass was a bit more was, was a bit easier. In fact, the Germans had nearly lost a battle cruiser about 15 months before at the Battle of the Dogger Bank um, and had learnt some lessons from that which the British hadn't. Uh, now the British shell also hang on, was not that brilliant uh, and did break up on occasion on German armour. However, I have to tell you German shell was not that good either and uh, certain, quite a lot of German shell broke up and this is a dud on board a British ship. Uh, to be fair, this seems to have actually bounced on the water and landed on the upper deck of a, dis of a somewhat surprised dis destroyer. Okay, now this is the main engagement. Now basically what happened was the Germans kept going north, chasing Beatty. Um, they did not know the Grand Fleet was at sea and the Grand Fleet, with its 24 battleships and columns, then does what's called a deployment into single line. And basically, single line is the only workable formation for, a sh for that number of ships. It's unwieldy, it's tricky, but it's the only workable formation. And what that does is the famous crossing the T. In other words, with Shear coming north, realising only too late in the reducing visibility that he's got the Grand Fleet in front of him, uh, British fire in the line is able to concentrate on the head of the German line, which basically can, crumples. Scheer does an amazing battle turn around, turns all his ships almost at the same time to get out of there, and then has, a, with the visibility being really poor and getting worse, and this is the average circle of visibility for the British Commander-in-Chief for the last daylight stages of the battle, he decides to have another go and he turns back. Now, in fact, had he been sort of shifted a few thousand yards, he might have isolated a section of the British line and been able to concentrate his fire against a few British ships. As it was, he actually uh, ran straight into the Grand Fleet again and got, it, and got his T crossed again, and effectively had to send his torpedo craft and his battle cruisers in, and it was a it was a, literally a death ride for the battle cruisers to force the British to turn away, which was their doctrine for a mass torpedo attack. Now, remember what I said: the ships are 200 meters long. There's 300 meters to the next ship. If you do a mass torpedo attack, statistically, that gives you a 40 percent chance of hitting. If, you, if the ships don't basically minimise their, their target area, and Jellico had always said he would turn away. So he did, and lost sight of the Germans. So Scheer then heads south. Now, that's where the German bases are. So although Jellico had turned away, that's not a bad, he's in a pretty good situation. He's between the Germans and their bases. But a night encounter follows. What happens is Jellico turns south, and Scheer, he puts his destroyers astern of him, which is the doctrine, and Scheer, desperate to get home, literally crosses the stern of the British, encounters the British destroyer flotillas, suffers some losses, but wins clear. There are massive failures of reporting by the British, so the Admiral, who is exhausted, and I think this is one of the points that's not stressed strongly enough, doesn't realise, despite a lot of evidence, that the Germans are crossing behind. Now, the British had a view about night action which is quite understandable. The Germans were much better at night fighting and much more prepared to do it because they were basically working on a coast defence construct. 
in the Heligoland Bight. They'd always expected the British would come to them and they'd always expected they'd know where they were. And if you know where you are and you know where your friends are, then night fighting's okay. The British viewed night fighting as totally uncertain because they expected to do it in the open sea. And how the hell do you tell at night who's friend and who's enemy? And indeed, all the exercises they'd done when they tried to send the destroyer flotillas off to find the enemy battle fleet at night, they'd never been able to find them. So there were quite good reasons for the British deciding that they'd only be reactive about night fighting. But it did create a mindset whereby they didn't realise that the vital thing was to actually tell Jellicoe that Shear was going astern of him. And basically, the next morning, dawn breaks, there's no German fleet. The British had suffered the loss of 14 ships, including three battle cruisers. The Germans had lost a battle cruiser, an old battleship, and nine other ships. Um, and it was summed up, the Germans made a big propaganda victory. The Saar, for instance, told the British Admiral, who was the British Naval Liaison Officer in St. Petersburg, that the first the Saar had known of the Battle of Jutland was the Germans holding up large signs in Russian on the Eastern Front for the Russians to say British fleet destroyed in great battle. Uh, the British did not handle the information side of this really well. The Saar was not that impressed. However, the Germans really did decide at that point that they were unlikely, um, that they really, this was not the thing to be doing. It is not true, however, the Germans never came out again. They had another go in August when they wanted to try more submarines, but not off the British ports, which hadn't worked, but out in the open sea, and Zeppelins. Um, they failed to beat the British fleet, luckily, basically because the Zeppelin sent the wrong report. They also came out again in April 1918 um, for, another, for another sortie against convoys, and again, um, that didn't result in an encounter of the fleets. Basically, the Germans form the view that the only way they can actually break the British hold is by going to unrestricted submarine warfare. That's what they're going to do. And Jutland really sets the pattern for the rest of the First World War at sea, which is going to be a war of submarine and anti-submarine. However, there's a lot going on still on the gunnery side. Um, yes, the battle fleet was too big. And it's very interesting that the post-war Washington treaties curiously create battle fleets of workable size. I always wonder whether that was one of the reasons why the admirals agreed to it. But they, in fact, when people say, oh, there was more delegation of authority, more flexibility, what in fact happens is they get really interested in two and four ship concentration of fire. And basically the idea being that you have a master ship which is controlling and reporting, and everybody else, these are the range clock and the bearing indicators, uh, and there's radio coordination going on, all sorts of short-range radios are fitted, so that two ships or even four ships could fire as one on the same target. Uh, and there's an enormous amount of work going on on that through the last two years of the war. Um, the higher the observer can be, the more information you can get. Exactly as Mark was talking, uh, this is a kite balloon which start to get taken to sea in 1916. They put midshipmen in, by the way, as the observers. Um, with the idea that the kite balloon, being high above all the smoke and everything else, has a much better chance of being able to report accurately the fire control solution, or rather the spotting. More aviation. Now, this I want to show you because this sums up the 1916 things. This is HMS Manxman, which has a flying off deck for land planes which have the speed to be able to get up high and shoot zeppelins down, and seaplanes, which have a second person in them who can read and write, who is the person who can actually be the reconnaissance guy, with all the difficulties Mark has already mentioned. That's the transitional stage. They're really interested in torpedo-carrying aircraft to strike the enemy. But the big problem at this stage is seaplanes haven't got the power to have the range and carrying capability for the sort of things they want. Furthermore, if you use land planes, 
and this really is all about naval artillery, how do you create a naval airstrike capability as you're learning how to go? This is HMS Furious, which is a really good crack at a very big aircraft carrier. But the big problem is, although they built a, uh, a landing, you know, it's a, almost got a continuous deck, but it's still got a superstructure and a funnel in the middle of things. And learning as you go, what happens, this is Squadron Commander Dunning landing on, he's actually landing on the forecastle, having literally flown around the superstructure and landed on. But the air currents are so horrendous that on a later landing, control gets lost, he goes over the side, bangs his head and drowns. And that's the reason why, by, why most of them died, if they died doing this, was they banged their head. But that's what they, but they do have this vision because what they want to do, and they're working it up, and by October 1918, oh, in fact, I'll just skip past this, by October 1918, this is HMS Argus, the first true aircraft carrier. They are working up for a massed torpedo strike on the German high sea fleet in its anchorages outside the German rivers. Um, so you could actually say with an R-class battleship up there, that's the first carrier battle group. However, they're also thinking in a few other ways. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is the K-class submarine for direct fleet support. Submarines were viewed as being having enormous potential at sea. Big problem, however, they weren't fast enough. In the technology of the time, they came up with steam, uh, which may sound weird, and yes, they took a long time to dive, but in fact it was a solution uh, which was better than people realise. Um, and got a bad name because of accidents the submarine suffered, some of which weren't entirely their own fault. Really, however, it's a, it's a dead end until you get the nuclear submarine. But they are trying very hard to have this all-arms approach for the fleet at sea. And finally, um, they also try to put a gun in a submarine. Um, worked quite well, actually. The submarine would almost surface, fire at a couple of thousand yards and dive again. It's an old battleship gun. Um, and trust me, when you actually get a, one of the most experienced submariners in 1916 writing in his diary that this is the wave of the future, you know, you have to understand that really, some really smart people are doing things which look really odd in retrospect. Okay, I think I'll finish at that. Just to say, uh, again, six degrees of separation and connections. The Amiens gun, the railway gun captured on the August 8th, 1918, which is at the Australian War Memorial, was at Jutland. Uh, it was on board the pre-dreadnought SMS Hessen uh, when the ship was taken out of serv active service and disarmed beginning in 1917, it was taken ashore. I asked the German Naval Historical Section whether they can confirm whether it's one of the guns of the Hessen that actually fired. We know she fired five rounds. At Jutland. I will have to say it looks as if they fired them at a phantom submarine um, rather than another battleship, uh, but it may be uh, that this is the only main armament gun left above water from the Battle of Jutland. Uh, and with that, I'll finish. Thanks.